Hey, it's the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. Dan, are you keeping warm? Oh, uh, we made it through Toronto snowpocalypse today. <laughs> Toronto snowpocalypse. That you just said to the rest of the country, we were wussy yesterday. Dear listeners, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> You're thinking about that time they brought in the army, and I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. We're tired of that. Yeah. Um, but you rode home yesterday. I right? rode home. Yeah. It was not pleasant, even with studded tires. The studded tires? Was... What's your take on the studded tires? They're the best things ever in the winter. Here's my thing, though. Oh, God. I'm thinking they are not the lifesavers you're expecting they are them to be. And the weight and the rolling resistance on the road outweighs the safety gains on the snow absolute rubbish well it's not absolute rubbish you're right you can still slide out on studded tires it's not like really putting chains on your truck tires is it it's not like that but the the traction gains are immense and it makes riding super fun so you'd say they're hashtag gains hashtag gains okay moving on moving on moving on uh we got a great show um I speak to people who need wicked traction. Um, there is, uh, there are four riders who will be riding through Northern Ontario. Um, they will be starting in Attawapiskat and then going along the bottom of James I'm Bay. I'm 100% sure where that is, but that sounds up there. It's way up there. And they're actually going to Nunavut from Ontario. It can be done. You'll find out how. Um, it's and not that far, though, in some parts, is it? It's really not that far. It's about 20 kilometers away in some parts. But uh, that's not to take away from this. No, it's cold and it's hard and they're doing good stuff. <laughs> Dan is actually into it. That may have sounded dismissive, but <laughs> right. he's actually really keen that on it. That was my genuine voice. That was genuine. We're g- I spoke with uh, former pro Ted King, who's on this ride, and Buck Miller, who is the uh, driving force behind this. And they are joined by two others. And we'll find out about that. Guy named Buck sounds like the kind of guy you want on this on this adventure. <laughs> and then what else do we have lined up? We have got the Rally UHC camp interviews by Molly Herford. It is the two Canadian Sarahs who are, I'm going to go say stars of the team. Yeah, yeah. They got some legit Palmares. We'll be talking to Sarah Bergen or Molly will be talking to Sarah Bergen and Sarah Poitivin. And what else? We have Coach Peter Glassford. Yes, I pepper him with questions about what kind of training I should be doing at this time of year. And not just me, but all of us amateur Is that riders. why you were trying to do pull-ups yesterday? That actually didn't come out of that discussion. I, But yes, I, I, we should be doing strength training. And so I embarrassed myself at the office by doing pull-ups. Arm day. At the stairwell <laughs> at arm day. Um, those numbers are top secret. And, oh... And how could I forget? We have full send, no send. And guess what? what? We try not go OT this time. We try. Yes, we've had a bad track record recently of keeping within the time limit. Do we even keep it in the time limit? Stay tuned. Let's hear. In a few days, four riders are leaving from Attawapiskat First Nation in northern Ontario for Nunavut. They'll aim their fat bikes into James Bay and head to Agamaski Island. It's about 20 kilometers from the mainland, but it is part of the Canadian territory that also includes the country's northernmost point. Yes, it's just 20 kilometers away from the province with the nation's southernmost point. That's Canadian geography for you. From Agamaski, the four will head south. They'll have a stop in Moosonee and Moose Factory. The ultimate destination is Smooth Rock Falls, Ontario, roughly 600 kilometers south of their starting point. The trip is called the James Bay Descent. Recently, I spoke with former pro cyclist Ted King, who retired from Team Cannondale Garmin after the 2015 season. He's one of the four riders and the only American on the team. The rest are Canucks. He spoke about his preparation for the trip and some of his concerns, which include polar bears. I then spoke with expedition organizer Buck Miller. He's a former member of the Canadian national team. He also lived on James Bay for five years. He spoke in detail about the challenges the quartet will face and the charitable component of their ride. But first, Ted King. Ted King, where did you sleep on the night of January 14th? Oh man, Um, if I were a guessing man, Based on recent memory, and I can't think exactly where I am, but the fact that you asked me this made, makes me think I was probably on the top of Whiteface Mountain in the Adirondacks, about, oh, I think 4,400 feet above sea level. 
And and how was that? Um, it was brisk. It it gave me a great respect for the creature comforts of home, uh, for heat, for a shower, for a bed, for a roof over my head. Um, but it was a pretty pretty great introduction to something really cool we've got in store. Okay, so why were you sleeping outside? And I gather you were in, were you in a tent? Were you in a bivy bag or something like that? Yeah, so um, we we made a slow ascent of Whiteface, which is I think I think the fastest dudes have done it in about fifty minutes, and we did it in about an hour forty because we're we're riding big old fat bikes up in Access Road that's thankfully closed to traffic, um, and we're carrying one heck of a lot of stuff on our bikes. So get to the top it's fairly exposed um we we nestled up next to a i don't even know what to call it there there are a couple buildings at the top we did sleep outside um two of the guys dug a snow cave of sorts and then we were in sort of a closet of sorts with with you know exposure to the elements like i slept on snow um but it gave us a, a good bit of a protection from wind and the total elements because Oh, man, it was wild. We went to bed. Absolutely stunning sunset. Um, Sun's down. Nothing else to do. Go to bed about 730. And we wake up the next day and we're socked in. Um, Wind is not howling, but it's ripping pretty good. And then there's there's like an ice fairing on the entire every inch, every square inch of the bikes. Um, So, yeah, we're uh, we're practicing for the James Bay descent. And given that we were convening there in in key new york in the adirondacks it made for a really good good way to get some high uh, high elevation exposure this adirondack trip was in preparation for the james bay descent uh what can you tell me about that ride we are gonna start and i'm gonna probably do a very poor job at pronouncing these these town names we're gonna start in Attawapiskat. I think that's mm-hmm. right. And then make our way east to Akimiski Island. Akimiski. Um, and then, you know, make our way slightly back onto, well, not slightly, we're going to be making our way back onto the mainland, um, riding ice roads initially. I mean, sort of not too much bushwhacking. And then we're on uh, snow roads descending southeast down to Musani. And then continuing on snow roads down to uh, Smooth Rock Falls. So all said and done, it's going to be about 600 kilometers. Um, and, you know, we might anticipate, oh, you know, when we're moving good, we'll probably do the ability to do 100K a day. But then, you know, the first bit is quite a bit of slow moving fat bike riding. I think we're expecting temperatures as low as about negative 40. Uh, I think we're expecting one heck of a lot of wind exposure. Um we are trying to be over prepared for any possibility um but yeah i mean this is like i said i'm a, i'm i like the creature comforts so it's great having this crew who's who's very aware of the outdoors and and uh respecting the outdoors and yeah it's going to be a pretty wild ride you said minus 40, and the good thing about that figure is it doesn't matter if you're talking about Fahrenheit or Celsius. I believe that's the same on both scales. I think that is exactly right. Yeah, I think it's around about <laughs> negative 42 that they both overlap, which is downright frigid. It's wicked cold. Yeah, yeah. What kind of food will you guys have? Well, I had my first camping meal in a very long time when we were up at the top of uh, Whiteface. And I was absolutely shocked with how delicious it was. I had a gourmet <laughs> macaroni and cheese. Um, the, the ingredient list was outstanding. I mean, it had a ton of great cheeses to it. It wasn't just like a bunch of chemicals and, and weird flavor additives. The thing was absolutely delicious. Um, so, you know, those pack light, you can chuck a whole ton of them in your bag, and then you're just merely adding hot water to them. Um, so that's wonderful and a whole lot of untapped so a lot of maple fueled adventure which is only fitting in this part of the world um i guess so yeah and so how are you how are you feeling about what you're getting into it's uh it's about when as we're talking now it's about two weeks away how are you feeling i'm excited i mean you know i'd lie if i didn't say i was a bit anxious i don't do a lot of camping but you know the bike practice week uh long weekend up in in the adirondacks was awesome i mean it made me 
Really excited to be working with this crew. And yeah, I mean, I can ride my bike all day, every day. Put me on a fat bike, a mountain bike, a cross bike, road bike. I can do that. That I recognize is definitely going to be the easy part. So we have a mixed bag of fitness levels and we have a mixed bag of outdoor uh, <laughs> far north camping levels. And I'm certainly on the spectrum of both. So mm -hmm. we've got our we got our strengths. It's sort of no different than a cycling team. And uh, and those who know what they're doing are going to be leading the way at particular times. Um, how do you feel about the, you know, the possibility of wildlife, uh, on your trip? Uh, yeah, that's definitely on my mind. Um, there are not polar bears where I'm from. I think <laughs> polar bears are cool, but as I've explained to Buck, I really prefer not to see them. Mm -hmm. Um, so that is something I've stressed extensively to Buck and I think he is aware of where I stand on things and... He has he has tried to do a very good job of explaining that up until this time the the bay has not actually been frozen so the bears are sort of wandering around looking for food whereas we now that we're finally getting some proper arctic temperatures uh, they're heading out on the on the on the ice they want to eat fish and and porpoises and other things much more than they want to investigate uh, trash dumps which is where they've been sighted in the past month. Yeah, I defer to Buck on that one. Ted King, thanks for your time, and good luck with the James Bay descent. Thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate it. Thank you. Buck Miller, we just spoke um, with Ted King, and I did bring up the topic of nuisance polar bears. I believe you, you, you said there were maybe two that have been spotted around um, Moosonee Moose Factory. Um, what's the strategy for polar bears? Yeah, so there were two. There were two seen in in Moose Moose Factory, which is a halfway point, which would is their most southern point of that's the most southern range. There was two uh, spotted in December. One of them was shot and killed. The other one they didn't find. Um, so our strategy for polar bears is I'm basically trusting my experience uh, living up there and having canoe tripped and traveled through polar bear country a little bit. Um, you know, it's now February. The ice is all the way across James and Hudson Bay. Well, although we're going to be traveling on the ice, uh, if if it's possible, like if, if it's totally impossible, we might go down the road, the ice road. But so we're, we'll be traveling down the ice with the with the super cold season we're having. The the bears are you know definitely out hunting seals uh, nowhere near shore, and actually at shore the like. It's, you're on mud flats for like a mile. So there won't even, seals can't even, even a high tide, seals can't come out close to the tree line um, at high tide on James Bay, uh, with, unless you're at a, a river mouth. Uh, so the little breathing holes are going to be out, you know, in kind of in, in the center of the bay. So they shouldn't be around. They could be around. They'd be known to cross into uh, the tree line every now and then through winter. And obviously we're going to, you know, carry smells with us and everything, like being stinky bike riders. And have a little bit of food with us. There's a chance they'll come through, but it's slim. Hmm. But we are in their we are in their neighborhood, so we just got to remember that we'll we'll have a gun with us. See, I was going to ask that. It, it was my understanding that bear spray doesn't really work with polar bears. Is that true? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I can't actually. I don't know anyone that has ever used it or tried it. Um, you know, but no, you you would never rely on on bear spray for polar bears. You'd be crazy. Right. Right. What can you tell us more about the route that you guys will be traveling? It's about 600 kilometers. Uh, tell me about the, the main stops. Yeah, so the main stops are going to be Moosney, which is a halfway point, Moosney Moose Factory. Um, we're starting in Attawapiskat First Nation, which is uh, 20 kilometers, 15 kilometers from James Bay on the Attawapiskat River. We're going to drive up there, jump out, ride over to Gamask Island, which is uh, every island in James and Hudson Bay is a part of Nunavut. We'll be cruising around uh, Agamski, which Agamski in the summer is littered with polar bears. There's all kinds of polar bears uh, on Agamski in the summer. Luckily, not winter. So we're going to cruise down Agamski, and then if the bay is passable, uh, we're going to take the bay all the way to Moose Neve. Um, we were going to duck into Cache and Albany, Kasachewan and Albany First uh, First Nations. They are halfway between, they're a quarter of the way down the trip, halfway between uh, Attawapiskat and Moose Neve. Uh, but we think we're just going to bypass and head straight to Moose Neve down the ice. If the ice isn't good, like meaning our bikes that are going to be 70 pounds each with gear, 
our crust our, our breaking through the top crust and we have to walk our bike everywhere well we you know we'll, we'll just take the ice road south um which is still going to be 600k so then we get to moose knee um we're probably going to be stopping at a school uh to talk about the trip and uh show show some kids some pretty cool gear and then we head south from there on the wheaton winter road which connects moose factory to uh, a forest access road which is used uh, for forestry and there's two remote hydro dams out to be canyon and otter rapids the wheatum road is 170 kilometers from from moose factory to otter rapids and then which just all muskeg you know frozen ice road and then uh, it's forest access road for 50 kilometers to abitibi canyon which is a really twisty turny um fun kind of roller coaster gravel road abitibi canyon is well known for uh snowmobiling they have sh some really steep big climbs with like nothing in the way um we're going to cross a creek called eleanor creek which is named i named my daughter after that creek that's where we used to go get water uh when we were at my dad's trap camp uh it was the local watering creek for us um that's on that road and then once we get to abitibi canyon forest access road uh mostly flat all the way to smooth rock falls which is where i was born and that'll be the end of the trip hopefully around day 10. nice and and who's meeting you in smooth rock falls uh nobody we, we no one we're there there is zero <laughs> there is no media we're gonna be alone freezing cold stinky and we're just probably gonna want to eat something deep fried fast right and then and then you guys all have to get yourself south after that yeah we're just gonna jump in uh, ryan's big red van and uh or someone's big big van that we're gonna be taking and uh that's the end of the trip we're gonna head home excellent excellent and um not long ago you guys were testing gear in the adirondacks um can you tell me about anything maybe you discovered or that struck you on that on that testing trip and that maybe you're going to change or, or use that knowledge when you when you get up to james bay packing uh, the big thing for us was packing we wanted to see our bikes can carry have about 40 liters uh in in uh capacity um with packs so we need to make sure that we can fit everything we're going to add maybe another 10 or 15 liters to that uh, sorry 60 liters on our bikes so we're going to add another 10 or 15 liters maybe 20 to that so we need to get um you know all of our gear each per person down to 60 uh 70 liters of of space so that's really tight like there's not a lot of room for any packing error if you forget something we get up there you're toast um so we we use the weekend to get as much of our gear our mandatory gear that we have to have on our bikes uh fitted with we we kitted them all out with the with the blackburn uh outpost touring bags uh and that was what i think uh that was super super important if we didn't do that beforehand we'd have been up there scratching our heads probably lacking some gear and uh this doesn't these don't sound like the conditions where you know uh, a piece of gear going missing or forgotten is something well it could have serious effect is that is that true yeah absolutely like it's we're gonna see 40 below for sure like there's no two ways about it we will see 40 below more than like a, a daytime high would be around 20, mm. 20 below. So that's your normal, like, well, not normal. That's like, you know, if, if you get 18 minus 18, we're, we'd be happy with that. Um, so your, your regular traveling temperatures are, are going to be, we're going to be in the, in the high twenties and thirties all the time. Uh, yeah. You have to have all of your gear. You have to keep moving. You can't afford to stop longer than it takes to get your bottle out, uh, drink what little you can drink um and eat food and get back on the bike like we got minutes before we we will start locking up being too cold and and then tell me about like setting up camp because you're 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 sleeping in the snow it doesn't sound like you've got a lot of time either from when you call no, it quits so, yeah. for the day no setting up camp is tough so so at night time there i dread setting up camp at night i don't mind tearing down camp in the morning because what we do the first thing we do in the morning is uh we we pack our stuff inside we leave the wood stove going as long as we can that's the last thing we take out is the wood stove so that as we're tearing down camp and packing our stuff we can run the tent heat our hands and keep tearing stuff down then when the tent has to come down in the morning we take the stove out keep it going outside and let our hands warm up while we're tearing the tent down mm -hmm. but at night you can't set the tent up uh you can't you can't take the wood stove out light it uh, and then set the tent up and bring a, a hot stove inside the tent and put the pipe through, right? Mm -hmm. So we basically set up the camp every night, uh, 
really really cold and and yeah it's just it's a death march you're just you know relying on everyone to do the job as quickly as possible so everybody can just warm up and it's more it's mostly your hands like you know your feet get cold no big deal but you need your hands like you need dexterity to do all kinds of little things right so yeah it's your hands setting up at night that really you know you pay for it it sucks no one looks forward to it and who has to carry the stove we haven't decided yet but you'd be the stove is it's not that big of a deal it's titanium sheet metal it's tiny super light it weighs you know my my, my 12 gauge shotgun is going to weigh a lot more than the stove so i'm carrying the shotgun <laughs> so i better not be carrying the tent and stove <laughs> that sounds fair that sounds fair yeah. um and then uh tell me about sweat is, is that a concern whether it, it happens throughout the day and then when you stop at night is that something that can affect you or or does anyone sweat when it's that cold yeah, no, uh, sweat is a concern. Doing anything in the coldest of temperatures, uh, you know, you, you're, we're going to sweat and we just have to keep it to a minimum. So you want to find that balance of staying warm enough, uh, but not sweating like crazy. So you need to ride enough to stay warm so you're not freezing to death. Uh, but you can't, you can't ride too hard because if you do get covered in sweat, it's just going to take that much longer uh, to dry. And it's going to be a terrible time when, when you're trying to dry out. Setting up camp is an hour. So we're at least an hour before we get a hot wood, wood uh, uh, fire going in the wood stove. So sometimes in, in, when we do get really, really wet, uh, what we've done in the past is build a, a fire just in the bush um, on the ground so we can warm up while we're setting up the tent. But mm -hmm. uh, you got to avoid sweat for sure. Interesting. Was this trip your idea? Yeah. Yeah, this was my, uh, so when I lived in Moose Knee, in Moose Factory, uh, from two, the, after I quit bike racing, 2009, 10 to 2015, um, I moved, I moved straight up there, uh, and I, I would commute, all, I would ride my bike all over town, it's, it's not a big town, but it's still very, very cold, and I'd ride all year round, uh, I put studded tires on my mountain bike, just a regular rigid Kona with thumb shifters, old school, like 1994 Kona. And I would ride all over town, and I loved it. And I thought, man, this would be a cool trip to do. But when you're living up there, you know, you're not cycling fit, so to say. So um, I just kind of waited. And now we live in Huntsville, and and uh, I'm back hanging around my my friends that ride bikes and and uh, you know love adventures. So I thought, what the hell? Let's go do this ride. And you know, it's totally possible, and we'll do it for a good cause. Tell me about that cause. It's the Timmins Native Friendship Center that you guys are raising money for when throughout this trip. Yeah, so the Timmins Native Friendship Center, right? We we chose to to do it for a char for charity. They're a nonprofit that kind of they're they're they they do all kinds of things. They operate like they do some employ. They help uh, they help locals with employment. Um, they offer free internet to everybody. They sometimes operate as a soup kitchen. They also have like parenting classes for at risk mothers. Uh, they even they've even put on canoe races for Aboriginal Day uh, in the past. Um, you know community events they do all kinds of great things up there well it does sound like a, a worthy charity and it also sounds like quite the adventure um we're going to be following it along on your guys um social feeds but um and yeah let's catch up afterwards to uh, hear about how it went yeah awesome thanks a lot matt all right take care buck buck miller is the organizer of the james bay descent a 600 kilometer fat bike trip that will mark the first ride between Ontario and Nunavut. Ted King is a former pro cyclist and rider taking part in the long, cold trek that starts February 4th. Ready and go. It's time for Full Send, No Send. We have five minutes on the clock. What is our first topic, Dan? Dear listeners, here's our first topic. Lucinda Brand is the most Canadian athlete we should be cheering for at the Cyclocross World Championships. Okay, that's absurd, but let me explain to our international listeners where this might come from. Um, Canadians have this instinct to Canadianify anybody who has even looked at Canada on a map. Here's an example. Pierre Garchon, Gachon, who was born in Paris in 1909, is considered by many the first Canadian to race in the Tour de France in 1937. What, He's did Canadian. Did he visit Montreal? He lived in Montreal. He raced a, a lot in we'll Canada. We'll take it. Exactly. So, but I think Lucinda Brandt is a... I cannot how confirm... Can you, how can you Canadianify Lucinda Brandt? I cannot confirm the last time she looked at an atlas and then at Canada. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Okay. 
Dutch are pretty much the Canadians of Europe. Everybody likes them. Everybody likes Canadians. <laughs> oh, man. You are... <laughs> Plus, she rides for Team Sunweb, which is sponsored by Cervelo, a Canadian brand. Okay, so... So there's that. Plus, <laughs> plus technically, one of the Dutch princesses... Which one? Princess Marguerite. Yes. Was born in a room... That was in Ottawa. Yeah, but then it was declared part of the Netherlands. Ooh, so interesting about that. It was actually declared international territory. Oh, we're going to run these five minutes down. Exactly. So the Dutch count her as their princess, can count her as their princess because she wasn't born in Canada. Because, so it was international territory. Okay, great minutia that still does not make Fun Lucinda facts. Brand Canadian. Also, um, Carlos Sastro won... The tour on a Cervelo R3. Is he the first Canadian to win the Tour de France? Show me the Colombian princess born in Canada. That is not enough to make Lucinda Red your favorite Canadian. I, this is, is, wouldn't it be nice this to just cheer for somebody who's like always gunning for the podium, though? Okay, that's harsh, dude. That's really harsh. That's harsh, but... I, I'm no send on this. I am rooting for Megalie Rochette, who finished fifth at the Cyclocross Worlds in 2017. Highest place Canadian ever. Uh, Maybe Lucinda Brand could be the next highest. She's not Canadian. But she could be. No send. Fine. (laughs) Moving on to the men's race. MVDP. Will he be the MVP of the world championships? Instead of not doing it for the third, fourth year in a row? Instead of the uh, capitulation of the last two years. Mm. I mean, he's won almost everything except for what? Two races? Yeah. Where he wasn't. Oh, three when he didn't show up. Okay, anyway, I think it's hard to bet against him. Full send on him winning. I hope I don't regret this. Yeah, I mean, but it's been full send every other time. He's always looked good. So I'm going to go no send. Good luck. I think he, I think he messes up again. Wow. I, think, I don't think it's Wout, though. Oh. I think it's Toon. Wow, because, well, okay. All right. All, All right. right, moving on, moving on. Oh, how are we doing for time? We got one minute and 50 seconds. Oh, All hurry right, up, hurry quick, up, hurry quick, up. Quick, quick, quick. Zwift Kiss Super League. Thoughts, no send, full send. Uh, uh, it is the uh, guitar hero of cycling. It, it is it is it has skills that mimic real bike racing. Uh, actually, I'd say it's more like cycling than guitar hero is to playing guitar. But uh, full send in what? Is it a good thing for people to do? Is it a good thing for people to watch? <sighs> this is a tough one. Are you into it? Are you not into it? Full send, no send? Will uh, you watch it? That- I I started watching it, but then had to do real work, so I didn't. It wasn't enough to distract me from work like the Giro d'Italia might or the Tour de France. You know what? This is a no send for me as well. No send. Oh. I I had it up, tried to watch. I guess it's okay. Again, though, not enough. <laughs> not no enough. send. No send. All right. All right. E-bikes in Fondos. The RBC Whistler Grand Fondo recently announced they'll be allowing e-bikes in their 55 kilometer event. Full send. I'm a full send on this one too. Oh, we agree. Oh. Okay, but here's my thing. <laughs> what? This isn't a race race. Right. People aren't, you know, this is more about completion. Yeah. I don't think you should get all up in a gruff if somebody passes you on an e-bike. No, don't worry about it, man. But I think the efforts ride. people are putting in are equivalent. So you're still sharing the suffering. You're still having the same experience. Mm-hmm. It's just maybe somebody who couldn't have been out there before, they're going to get out there with yeah. you. To modify the Greg LeMond quote, you, 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 don't necessarily go faster. It still no. Hurts. It doesn't get easier. It no. goes just goes faster. It, but it is easier, and you go faster. But it still hurts. Oh, with apologies to Greg Levant, and we're out. Greg's still alive, but if he wasn't, he'd be rolling in his grave over that. <laughs> that is garble, and uh, that's time. Um, we actually got it done in the five minutes. Can we, can we figure out how the remote stops? No, you got to figure out how to oh, turn I your... Oh, I just had my old, old man moment. <laughs> yeah, how does this phone work? Where's my VCR? Right. Full send, no send. All right. How's your training going? Mine's... Okay, I'm I'm still happy with the frequency of my trainer rides and the bit of cross-country skiing I'm doing on weekends, but I've been wondering about my endurance. Traditionally, 
this time of year is the point in our training when we should be building our base. But our hour-long trainer rides, and they are only an hour long because that's all I can really take on a trainer, but are these rides and the, the cross-country skiing enough? What should I be doing with the time I have available? As an amateur rider with a job and a family, I brought my questions to Coach Peter Glassford. Peter Glassford, how's it going? Very well, very well. Yeah, excited to be back on the show, and we're into the new year here. So, yeah, so I, I'm actually relatively fit, I think, myself right now and excited for that. And clients seem to be moving along sort of wherever they are. I was just talking to one client in Manitoba, and it sounds very cold there. So. <laughs> it's That's a common theme across the country right now. But um, what I want to talk about is... Um, Fit and fitness wise, um, a lot of us are it's January and February, probably when this pod comes out. Um, and traditionally, this is a, a time to work on base, but we're in Canada and we have certain restrictions like snow, ice, cold. And what are ways of working on endurance and with, you know, with my trainer, with my, say, time restricted uh, lifestyle? work, family, all that stuff. And yeah, how can I make endurance gains at this time of year with those factors at play? Really what we're trying to do now is just be generally fit and, and that fitness hopefully is increasing. Uh, and that might be your CP20 or your threshold or whatever you care about, right? You're, you're going to pick aspects of your fitness. It might be strength training uh, that are going to increase during the general preparation period. It, it could be skiing. That would be great if you got outside too. Um, so general preparation is about becoming generally fit and healthy uh, is another piece we often miss. And, and that's really, to me, what this January, February, March is, is really about is sort of setting the base, if you will, or becoming generally prepared so that then you can tell me, OK, in April, May, June, I want to be ready for X event in July. And so that's really what this winter in Canada or winter as any working you know, working person, working adult, uh, is, is just preparing and becoming generally fit. Ah, so instead of worrying about like that, you know, because I am looking at the pros and what they do, it's sort of hard not to, instead of saying, oh, I'm not doing these mad, mad base miles like these guys, I just should scrap that from the list because like you said, I'm not earning a living like that, but instead prepare myself in a general way um, for the season. So what are what are some general prep tips or what are some of the areas uh, I should focus on? Right, yeah, and I, I mean, just to reiterate, you can't possibly do the Tour de France, right? It, it's, it's not an option, right? Like day one, six hours, <laughs> like it's just not an option, right? Like there aren't the hours, there isn't the energy, right? And, and, and you know, you'll see people try to do three hours. They start at 7 p.m. and they finish at 10 p.m. And, and kudos to them. But, um, you know, again, there's sort of that health piece and the keeping marital relations together and, and work, you know, being energized for work and stuff. Right. And sleep yeah. is important. So um, just to reiterate, like th those options aren't options for most of us. Right. So. Right. So the options then are a I would start. OK, I'm starting in January. You know, there was Christmas holidays, you know, I was busy, you know, getting ready for that and work year end. So then you might actually be able to use some of those base principles of increasing volume. So maybe you start with like a couple 30 minute rides and you gradually increase those up to, you know, just easy. And I, I'm talking sort of 70 under 75 percent max heart rate or, you know, endurance zone, zone one, two. Um, and you're going to just increase your volume until, you know, that that training stimulus is not making you faster. And again, that might be a threshold test. That might be the wattage you're putting out at that set heart rate. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to gauge that. But you're going to increase your volume until which point you can't and you're not adapting to it. Right. Because why would you work harder in my mind? Um, and that could be skiing. That could be some strength training, some core um, some running if you're able to run safely um, or it could all be on the trainer um, so to me that would be like a January early February maybe even later depending on when your goals are in the season and that used to be you know we might call that base one or general preparation period one where it's pretty general 
um, in terms of thinking about your actual goal. So if your goal is cyclocross, you know, obviously riding really easy is not overly specific, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's what I would start with is just if, if you can increase your volume, I would increase your volume by increasing your volume or increasing the number of rides or both. Okay. And then what happens when I run up against, say, the, the hours of the week that I can train? Like there's sort of no more volume in terms of hours. Yeah. Then do I start upping up the difficulty a bit? Yeah. So I would, I, I usually do a little extra push there to see if there is any frequency. Cause I, I really like frequency cause it doesn't get talked about or you could call it density, I guess too. So I would, I would push you a little bit to see if there was like, could we do two rides on a Saturday, you know, or if you were going again, I saw you skiing. So maybe on the morning you could do like a, a quick ride at a bed or something and then have breakfast and then go to the ski thing. Um, so mm. push, if we could get a couple extra workouts in there, strength might help there. Um, but we will hit that volume uh, limit. So then uh, that may actually turn again to be sort of your base two or three where you can start incorporating what I would call muscular endurance, but is sort of your tempo, sweet spot, even threshold. Um, and and so those are just those sort of like more moderate intensity zones. Um, I, I think there's lots of value to doing that. Um, the key being that like anyone who... Who, like so Mr. Sweet Spot Frank Overden who came up with it like a big part of his philosophy still involves endurance training um, and, and if you go across any of the models it, it, there still is endurance training so it's not sweet spot or, or go as hard as you can every time you ride but I would start inserting one or two uh, muscular endurance so again tempo or uh, so this would be zone three into low zone four uh, workouts into your week. So one or two of those where you sort of do your three by tens, three by fifteens, two by twenties, uh, that sort of thing. And that's going to increase the load on the week then. So you have your eight hours, but now you've increased some intensity. So that's increasing the load of the week. All right. Well, these are some great tips, Peter, which I know I'm going to use, uh, or at least try to use and keep that frequency or density going, uh, in these early months of the year. And, yeah. um, we will have some more questions for you in a later podcast. Thanks for your time, Peter. Love it. Yeah, if anyone has any follow-ups, there's definitely lots of ways to do it. So if anyone has special circumstance or whatever, definitely shoot in those questions. Right on. Take care. Peter Glassford is a professional coach and head of Smart Athlete Coaching Services. You can listen to more training advice on The Consummate Athlete, a podcast by Peter and his wife, Molly Herford. Send your Ask a Coach questions for Peter to podcast at cyclingmagazine.ca. In early January, contributor Molly Herford was at the Rally UHC cycling team camp in Southern California. Rally UHC is a well-established U.S.-based project that became a UCI continental-level team in 2018. For years, the squad has had many Canadians in its ranks, from riders to directors to management. In fact, in 2015, I wrote a cheeky story about how the team had been successfully infiltrated by Canucks. Molly spoke with two Canadians, Sarah Bergen from Vancouver and Sarah Poitavin from Calgary. Last year, Bergen won the points jersey at the Joe Martin stage race. This year, she's already been racing in Australia, including in the Tour Down Under. In 2018, Poitavin won the best young rider jersey in three stage races. Those are the Tour Cycliste Feminine Internationale d'Ardèche, the Tour of California, and the Tour of the Gila. The two spoke about how they got into the sport and their season ahead. They also have tips for new cyclists. Uh, my name is Sarah Poitavin and I'm from Calgary, Alberta. Awesome. And how exciting is it to be in California instead of Calgary right now? <laughs> oh, it's super nice, yeah, to be riding on the road and with my teammates. 
and with any amount of sunshine and not five feet of snow. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, the w- warm weather is always a nice break from the winters. Yes, I have friends that are stuck in the Calgary airport right now, actually. Oh, no. So, <laughs> um, how long have you been riding for? Um, this is my fourth year on rally, and I started road racing just a few years before that. Okay. So how old were you when you started riding? Um, I grew up mountain biking. I grew up in Canmore, Alberta, and then um, switched over to the road when I was 16. Okay. That's a really hard switch to make when you live in one of the nicest mountain biking (laughs) spots in Canada. Yeah. (laughs) So what made you shift to the road? Um, I just, uh, well, I I spent a couple years doing both road and mountain bike racing, and then um, just found I I liked the road a a bit more, so I pursued that. Mm Mm-hmm. And how did you end up on Rally? Um, I, I uh, spent a couple of years racing for a local club in Calgary and then um, decided that it was something that I wanted to um, try to pursue professionally. So then I um, reached out to a, a few different teams and, and yeah, Rally was interested. And um, yeah, so it, it worked out. Um, it was good timing because at that point they were taking on a lot of um, development riders. So there are a few of us who got on Um, the team then as uh, super young riders and have developed with the team over the past few years. Yeah. Sarah Bergen, how did you start riding bikes? I used to commute on uh, my hardtail mountain bike during university to school. And as any good commuter in Vancouver knows, like you don't like soft pedal your commute. Like we kind of tongue in cheek, like call it the commuter Olympics. So like, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I I hit that commute like really hard on that hardtail mountain bike. And that kind of is what first sparked my interest in like the road, to be honest, because I'm like, like, I like going fast and I like kind of like going after it. And yeah, so after school was done, I had a little bit of scholarship and grant money left over and I literally funneled it into my first road bike. How did you get into cycling in general? Because I mean, it's not a sport that a lot of girls find at a young age. Yeah, no, um, well, uh, growing, growing up in Canmore, it was, it was easy to find the mountain biking, and uh, my family did quite a bit, so we would go out together, um, and then um, it was definitely, like, there was really only maybe one or two other girls my age who were doing it, um, and I, I didn't take it, like, super seriously until I was a little bit older, when I started to do bigger races, and... Um, yeah, it was more of um, something I did on the side for fun mm-hmm. growing up. But um, yeah, definitely. Well, there's there's more and more girls getting into it at home, um, which is awesome to see. But I was definitely, um, yeah, more of a, a male-dominated sport when I was growing up. So wait, where does racing come in then? Yeah, so there's a local kind of fondo. It's like the Vancouver Whistler Fondo. And that was my first kind of like entry into racing. Like, I've always, like, as I've said, done competitive sports and I'm, I'm a pretty competitive person. So I didn't really know, like, you know, like how to start racing. I literally had no clue how to start racing. So this Fondo was kind of like my first step in that. And for anyone who knows, Fondos aren't at all races. They're like a fun ride together as a group. But once again, <laughs> and you take on these things, you take them on full on. So, yeah, so I rode the Fondo and in my mind, I raced the Fondo and it was great. And then I actually got connected with a really great group of local riders. And I was like, hey, dudes, like, I want to race. I don't know where to start. And they're like, okay, we will show you the ways. And this is, <laughs> and this is, this is how you do it. Yeah. <clears throat> and actually, if you could, like, talk to any of those, like, young girls now, what kind of advice would you give them for getting into it and, you know, making a career of it? Um, yeah, just uh, that it's, it's actually possible to make cycling a career and, um, if that's something they they choose to do, and um, yeah, no, uh, cycling like whether it's mountain or road, it's it's a great community of people, and so it's a really awesome sport to be involved in. Mm-hmm. So, how many years have you been racing pro? Yes, I've been. This will now be my third year with Rally Cycling, and before that, I raced with Red Truck Racing, which is a local Vancouver team, but it's more like of like a stepping stone, yeah, yeah, yeah. up into the pro leagues, yeah. And so what are your goals for this coming year? Oh, just have super, super amounts of fun. But actually. Uh, <laughs> but really. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. To have fun and, and to go really, really bloody fast. Yeah. So the season's long and it's looking it's looking like it's going to be really full. So definitely targeting some of that, that later season European stuff mm-hmm. is, is some of the priorities. Um, but honestly, like I can't 
like underline the importance of just like having a good time and enjoying what you do because like we put in like a ton of time on the bike and as a team like we we have like a lot of the same returning riders so we have a great chemistry and just keep that going and like support your teammate be a good teammate have fun the rest Mm -hmm. is gonna follow so yeah and I mean with that kind of hectic schedule what's your strategy for staying I mean healthy during it we'll say healthy and recovered yeah it's it's kind of it's been like an evolution in a way just because like I'm relatively new to the sport and like like you're, you're eager and you may like bite off like too much like too much like more than you can chew pretty much um so my strategy over the past couple of years has been really trying to listen to your body which sounds really basic and simple but it's a lot harder than it seems because yeah. you know we kind of train ourselves to push through and to persevere but to actually to listen to what your body's telling you and like yeah you need to like take a couple chill days and really prioritizing that and also don't burn it at both ends so like my when I first started riding I was working full-time like I had a professional job and then training full-time and it's like the epitome of burning it at both ends you mm-hmm. get home from racing you're like yeah I'm gonna do a 40-hour week no problem and I'm like as ah, it's not really sustainable for like I don't know, just overall health and wellness. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what are your goals for this coming season? Um, Yeah, lots of different goals. So this season is really exciting for the team because um, we're transitioning more to um, have more European races in our schedule. Um, So we'll do um, a lot of the same North American races in the early season, uh, which will be good. So, um, yeah, and uh, and then we'll have the opportunity to try out some some new and and bigger races over in Europe in the second half of the season so yeah really exciting for the team that's super exciting have you raced in Europe before yeah we've done a few races together so um yeah no we're excited to do to do more and um having um a lot of the same teammates with uh we only have a couple of new additions and know they're fitting really well in with the team. So, yeah, no, I think we have really good um, cohesion and that will make a big difference as we start to do new, new races. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do you tell when you're getting tired and need to take a break versus that time you need to push through? Have you figured out where that is? Because I'm always like, am I lazy or do I really need a rest day? Yeah, it's so, it's so bloody tricky. And it might be like a bit of trial and error but for me I'm trying to think if there's like because I've really I've thought like long and hard about this and I think for me it's when I literally don't want to do it because like 99% of the time I really want to do it but Mm -hmm. then as soon as like that motivation starts to like slip a bit just knowing like how I'm as a person I'm like that's usually like a pretty big signal that I should chill out for a bit yeah yeah because I don't lack that like motivation for sure yeah All right, um, and last question for Canadian Cycling. What is your best tip for a new cyclist or like the hardest thing you had to learn? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Oh, there's, oh, can I do two? I'm gonna do two. Yes, do two. (laughs) First tip, maybe three. So first tip, I would say get a bike fit just because you you Mm -hmm. touch the bike in three spots. Like you're gonna make those spots count. And like that way, like invest and be kind to your body. Like, Like you're gonna sit on that saddle for a long time like get some good shoes, some good kit and really get comfortable on your bike because if you're struggling like from, you know, the get go and you're going to start riding, it's just going to frustrate you. So that's tip one. Tip two is take a lot of tasty snacks with you because motivation and it's never fun bonking or getting super cranky on a ride. <laughs> and I don't know, I'm doing three tips because, well, this isn't really a tip, but um, just like ride with people and have fun and because the community like all throughout Canada like I've been lucky enough to travel throughout the country check out a lot of roads but there's tons of cool people out there who've stoked on bikes so like yeah Mm -hmm. ride with them I love that you pretty much hit the three topics that I've written books about so I'm like (laughs) super excited about that perfect perfect Perfect. well done (laughs) awesome Molly Herford is a Canadian cycling magazine contributor she also co-hosts the consummate athlete podcast with her husband Peter Glassford Sarah Bergen and Sarah Potvin are members of Rally UHC Cycling. And that's the episode. Uh, it was put together by Dan Walker, Philippe Tremblay, me, Matthew Piero, and it was produced by Adam Killick. Now, if you want more of what we're doing at Canadian Cycling Magazine, follow us on Instagram at 
Canadian Cycling on Twitter at Canadian Cycling as well. On Facebook, it's cy- at Cycling Mag. And remember to download, rate, subscribe, but only if it's five stars and only if it's something nice. Do you know where you can they can listen to us, Matthew? They can listen listen to us everywhere where you get That's podcasts. Apple Podcasts, yeah. Stitcher, yeah. Google Play, yeah. Spotify, TuneIn, yeah. and SoundCloud. Yeah, and a good old RSS feed will hook you up, yo. Um, and this time, when you're recommending your podcast, oh, yeah. who do they recommend, Matthew? You should recommend this podcast. Okay, you're at the hardware store. You're buying a ton of wood screws to make your own studded tires. And when, when the guy at the or gal at the hardware store says, hey, bud, what's with all the wood screws? And you, you, know, you tell this person that you're making your own studded tires. You can also say, hey, you know what? You should also listen to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. Boom. That's another go. 10 listeners right there. More than 10. Um, if you have topic ideas for Full Send, No Send, send us an email at podcast at cyclingmagazine.ca. And if you have questions for Coach Peter Glassford, also send those to the same address, podcast at cyclingmagazine.ca. And one more thing. Just want to thank our dear listeners for making the last episode the most listened to episode in the history of the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. Yes. Keep those downloads coming. Thank you, everyone. And also thank you to the Ontario Media Development Corporation for its support. We'll see you next time.